Doxology, good morning. Hey, grab a Bible and get to Numbers chapter 13 this morning. Numbers chapter 13. And uh, if you need a Bible, go ahead and borrow one of these. If you need to borrow one or keep one to get it in front of you, go to page 100. Page 100 in these. In just a second, I'll meet you on the bottom right-hand part of page 100. Numbers chapter 13 is where we're at today for day 15, week number three of the 40-day lab. And if you're just joining us today, hopping into the series, first of all, welcome. Let me catch up on where we've been over the last couple of weeks. Uh, we said all the way along, I think most of us encounter and experience God about the same way that we do organic chemistry. If you ever took organic chemistry. It's primarily an, an intellectual exercise that we go into where we listen to a qualified expert tell us the facts that we need to know in order to prepare us for a final exam someday. And all along the way, we collect facts that we really don't expect to ever encounter or experience, at least not in our everyday life. In fact, about the only time we expect to experience them or encounter them are right there in the place of the lecture. But when we go out from the place of the lecture, we really don't expect to have a whole lot to do with uh, that in our everyday life. So the way that we treat organic chemistry, I think it's the way a lot of us treat our encounter and experience relationship with God. And I think God wants better for us than that. I mean, heck, I think your organic chemistry professor wants better for you than that. That's why they give you the lab, right? And the lab, the whole point of a lab, we've said this all the way along, the lab is like a bridge between the lecture and your everyday life. You go into a controlled environment. You get a chance to get your hands dirty. You, you do some experiments to sort of play with the things that you learn in the lecture, to experiment with them, to experience them, to prepare you for when you get to the point that you experience them and encounter them in everyday life, in real life, wherever you go. That's the idea of the 40-day lab. See, here's the thing. All throughout the story of God, if you look at these pivotal moments in the story of God, God will make a promise to his people. It's a lecture. And then he invites either all of his people or one of his people to go into a 40-day, 40-night lab to live with his promise, to live with the lecture, to prepare them to live into it in their everyday life and often to lead through it with other people in their everyday life. That's the whole idea of the 40-day lab. So up to this point, as we've been journeying with them through the 40-day lab, and if you haven't signed up for that experiment, uh, there's a way to do that on your worship guide, the sermon notes part there. You can text a number or a word to a number, and we'll send you a text every single day with just an experiment for you to do, to try to live into the promise and the presence of God in your everyday life wherever you go. So far, we walked alongside Noah. The very first uh, lab we see is Noah, and he learns that you can't have the promise of God without the person of God, no matter how hard you try. Then last week we looked at Moses and what Moses reveals for us is that God wants better for every single one of us than just for God's people to be a whole bunch of rule keepers and ritual doers. God wants us to be the kind of people, and in fact the whole point of the rules was to create a system where we remembered his presence where we went and we reflected his presence wherever he took us. That's the whole idea of what God told the people of Israel to do. And it's part of the invitation that we have as Christ followers today as well. Because it's only in the presence of God, when we live in the presence of God, that we find the peace of God. And it's only in the presence of God that we find God's purpose for our lives, that we find God's provision for us and his blessing and life and hope and life with a capital L. It's the only place we find is in the presence of God. And God's designed us to be people that walk with him every single day, not just in the place of the lecture on a day like this day. And yet the truth is, for most of us, we're anticipating God's promise. We're anticipating living in God's presence and experiencing God's provision someday far away. But it's not really the kind of thing that we ever expect to encounter or experience outside of the place, maybe on a Sunday, where we hear the lecture from the qualified person who gives us the facts that we need to know prepare us for someday far away. So here's the question. If it's true, that the presence of God and the promise of God is available for people like us today, and I believe that it is, why is it that we don't experience it? Well, we would say the truth is every day, there's a lot of reasons why we don't really experience it. So here's the question for us today. What do you do when the problems of life seem bigger than the promise of God? You ever been there? What do you do? When the problems of life, you got them, I got them, feel bigger than the promise of God. Like we'd experience the peace of God and the presence of God and provision from God and purpose from God, but other stuff keeps getting in the way every other day except the day that we're here in the place of the lecture 
We don't get to experience it in real life because other stuff keeps crowding it out. There's stuff out there. There's stuff in here. Like, what do we do? What do you do when the problems of life seem bigger than the promise of God? That's what we're going to find. We look in Numbers chapter 13. You're going to see a promise, a lecture. You're going to see the lab. Shows us what to do. The problems of life are bigger than the promise of God. I heard a story uh, the other day about a guy that went to the doctor. And he shows up at the doctor's office and sits down, waits for the doctor. The doctor finally comes in and says, what seems to be the problem? The guy says, well, uh, here's the thing. Like, I hurt everywhere. And the doctor says, like, everywhere? And he says, yeah, sharp, shooting, stabbing, pain everywhere on my body every time I touch it. The doctor says, well, that's, uh, like, I've, I've never heard of something like that before. Um, is it possible that you'd show me? what you're talking about? The guy says, I, yeah, I think I can. So he touches his head and just screams in agony, ah! Then he touches his shoulder and says, oh! Doubles over in pain, touches his hip and says, oh! His knee, oh! And his toe. And he's about to pass out and finally the doctor looks at him and says, don't do any more of that, you dummy. I know what your problem is. You have a dislocated finger. Isn't it true physically one thing can be the thing behind all of the other things? You know, it's true spiritually as well. And today as we look at the people of Israel, they find themselves with an opportunity, yet they find themselves thinking everything hurts. And as we look at the story, what we're going to discover is it's the way they're using their eyes that reveals a problem in their heart that totally affects their hope as they try to navigate the way forward. The tendency of something they have to do with their eyes reveals a problem with their heart that completely affects their hope. Look with me at Numbers chapter 13, beginning in verse 1. Numbers chapter 13, beginning in verse 1. The Lord said to Moses, Send some men to explore the land of Canaan, which I am giving the Israelites. From each ancestral tribe, send one of its leaders. Okay, so don't miss this. This is the lecture part, right? God makes a promise to Moses, and he makes a promise through Moses to all of the people of Israel. And you notice, if you've been tracking with our story very long, or if you're familiar with the Bible, this is not a new promise. This is the same promise, the same lecture that God gave to Abram, that Abram passed on to his son Isaac, that Isaac passed on to his son Jacob, that Jacob passed on to his son Joseph, that's now made it all the way to Moses and all of the people of Israel, that God was going to give them a land. Up to this point, they've experienced the presence of God, but it's traveled with them, the place hasn't ever been permanent for them. They're constantly on the move, even with the presence of God, and they can't ever find rest. And they desperately want rest. Come on, you've experienced this before. If you've ever traveled, like with a spouse or a best friend, family, people that you really like being around, but you've traveled for a really long time, even when you're with people that you really love and you love being around, at some point, don't you just kind of want to be home? That's what these people are starting to experience. It's true even when the person that you're traveling with is God himself. For a couple of years now, the people of Israel have been wandering around in the wilderness, traveling in the wilderness. They're free from Egypt. They're no longer slaves. But they can't really rest. They find themselves really ready to be home. Where we pick up the story, they are camped almost literally on the front porch of the place that God's promised. The place that he said would be their forever home. Notice how it begins. God says, send one man from each of the 12 ancestral tribes to explore the land of Canaan, which I'm giving to the Israelites. Now, notice he says the land that I'm giving to the Israelites, not send them to the land that I'm considering for the Israelites. It's not what God says. The land that that is a possibility for the Israelites, if all of the stars align and everything works out just the right way, uh, then they'll have this land. I want them to go check it out first. God says, this is a promise that I'm making. This is a land that I'm giving to you. I want you to go see it place that I've promised where my presence is going to go with you and remain with you, stay with you. And remember what comes with God's presence in this place. They're expecting to find a place that's filled with peace from God, provision from God, the purpose from God. God says this is a place where you'll experience that forever. They're right there on the front porch 
just a few miles away. And God says, I want you to send a representative from each of the 12 extended families that are all surrounding this place. Send a representative from each of the 12 tribes. And then in verses 17 to 20, Moses sends them and he says, go into the land, spy it out. Check out the promises of God. I want you to go look at the place. I want you to go look at the people there and bring back a report. I want you to look at the produce of the place. Bring back a report of everything that you see in the land that God's promised. Bring it back and tell us all about it. And when you look at it at first glance, it sort of seems seems like what Moses is telling these representatives from the tribe is, go make sure that God hasn't over-promised and under-delivered. Right, go into the land, spy it out, check it out, make sure that God didn't give us a nasty land that none of us want to go into before we take everybody into this land that God has promised. But if you read the passage carefully, that's not at all what's happening. Moses is sending one representative of each family into the land so that they could see God's promise in person. They could live there for a period of time in a controlled environment, get their hands dirty in the place of the promise of God so that they can come back to their families and be the representatives and authority on God's promise for their families to be able to say to their families, hey, you got to come with us. You can't miss this. we got to go today. This place is incredible. It's everything that God promised. You still tracking with me? All right, so we've said all the way along, we're not the people of Israel. You and I, God hasn't promised us a land with borders and dirt and soil like he promised to the people of Israel. But if it's true, and I absolutely believe that it's true on this side of the cross, That God has promised us his permanent dwelling within us and beside us and in front of us and behind us wherever we go. But that most of us aren't living into today. Is it possible that we're right on the front porch? And not just us, the people that we love and the people around us are right on the front porch of experiencing his permanent presence with us wherever we go. And that what our family needs, what our neighborhood needs, what our campus needs, what the nations need is someone who will live there first and come back as an authority on the promise of God to tell their story to the people who live around them. Why not us? Don't answer that. Let's let the people of Israel answer it because they got some reasons. Look what happens. Numbers chapter 13, beginning in verse 21. So they went up, explored the land from the desert of Zin as far as Rehob toward Lebo Hamath. They went up through the Negev and came to Hebron where hard name, hard name, and Talmai, the descendants of Anak, lived. <laughs> Hebron had been built several years before Zoan in Egypt. When they reached the valley of Eshkol, means cluster, they cut off a branch bearing a single cluster of grapes. Two of them carried it on a pole. Don't miss that. Two of them carried it on a pole between them, along with some pomegranates and figs. That place was called the valley of Eshkol because of the cluster of grapes the Israelites cut off there. At the end of how long? 40 days, they returned from exploring the land. So that's the lab, right? They spend 40 days spying on the promise of God with their little eye. And they come back after 40 days with a report. And not just with a report, they come back with some visual aids to support their report. One cluster of grapes that it takes two dudes to carry. Some pomegranates. And some figs to show off to a nation of people who have lived for two years on nothing but manna and quail. This has to be it, right? Like it's worth it. You got to come with us. That has to be the report that the visual aid supports. Except that's not the story that they tell. Why not go in right now? They're going to give us four reasons that they choose not to go in right now. And see if they don't sound a whole lot like the four reasons we give for not living in the presence of God places that we go every day. Let's read the report and then we'll talk about it. Numbers chapter 13, look at verse 27. They gave Moses this account. Here's what they said after 40-day lab in the land, spying on God's promise. We went into the land, which you sent us, and it does flow with milk and honey. That's the picture of abundance. Here's its fruit. But the people who live there are powerful. The cities are fortified and very large. Very large. 
We even saw descendants of Anak there. The Amalekites live in the Negev. The Hittites, Jebusites, Amorites live in the hill country. And the Canaanites near the sea along the, Ju- uh, the, along the Jordan. Skip down to verse 32. And they spread among the Israelites a bad report about the land they'd explored. They said, the land we explored devours those living in it. All the people we saw were of great size. We saw the Nephilim there. The descendants of Anak come from the Nephilim. We seem like grasshoppers in our own eyes. And we looked the same to them. And that night, all the members of the community raised their voices and wept aloud. All the Israelites grumbled against Moses and Aaron. The whole assembly said to them, If only we had died in Egypt or in this wilderness. Why is the Lord bringing us into this land only to let us fall by the sword? Our wives and children will be taken as plunder. Wouldn't it be better for us to go back to Egypt? So they see the fruit, but they see four other things too. And see if these same four things aren't the same four things that some of us use as reasons why we don't walk into the place God's inviting us to walk into when we go there every single day. First thing that they see is resistance. If you want to write that down, they see resistance. You can see it in the way that they report. They didn't expect that the promise of God would bring any struggle or discomfort or resistance at all. And isn't that the way that it is for some of us? Like we're all for following God. We're all for walking with God every day wherever we go as long as it doesn't get uncomfortable for us. As long as there's no resistance to us. Most of us just assume that a life following God is always going to be the path of least resistance. And when resistance comes, we quit. We tell people, well, God closed the door. But what if resistance doesn't mean that God's closed the door? Doesn't mean God closed the door here. God's ready to blow the door wide open. But they stop short. They see the potential for fruit and provision and blessing. They also see the potential for resistance. They decide the fruit's not worth that. So the first thing in their way is resistance. The second thing in their way is relationships. Relationships, which is where some of the resistance comes from, isn't it? It was for them, it is for us. And notice, it's not just relationships around them. It is relationships around them. It's also relationships outside of them. Chapter 13, verses 28 and 29, they say, hey, we're surrounded by people that are not like us. The whole place that we're going, the place that we're walking, when we walk there every day, there are people that are not like us everywhere we go. They're in the coast, they're in the mountains, they're in the countryside, they're in the big cities, and they're powerful. Like, here's the problem with the place that God's calling us to walk when we walk there in his presence. We're going to be out of sync with all of the people that live around us. We can't live like that. It's dangerous. We're going to be surrounded by people that don't look like us. They don't think like us. They don't value what we value. They don't vote like we vote. Those people don't believe like us. They'll devour us. It would be great to devour the fruit. If we live in the presence of God and the provision of God, we walk towards the promise of God and the world around us, before we ever get a chance to devour the fruit, the people in the land, the world around us, the culture around us, they're going to devour us first. So let's just punt. Let's just live near the promise of God. Let's live in a place that's less than his promise and settle for being close some of the time. We can't live in God's presence and survive in a place like this. So let's pass on living into his promise today. Doesn't that sound like us? We don't want to reorient our life around the person and presence of God because it's scary to think about what the people around us would think of us if we did, what they'd do to us if we did. We're outnumbered. But notice it's not just the outsider relationships that causes them to stop short. This kind of fear is contagious. It starts with 10 out of 12 spies talking about the outsiders, but it pretty quickly spreads like Ebola to chapter 14, verse 1. It's the whole community. It's all of the Israelites. Now the fear isn't just what the foreigners will do to us. Now it's what their family will do to us. What's mom going to think if we live into the place that God's promised? What's my wife going to think if I 
live every day like that? What do my husband think? What do my community group think? The momentum is running away from me, even when it comes to people who ought to be for me. So I see the potential for fruit, but even ridiculous provision and blessing doesn't seem to be worth the social cost to me. So they opt out of the promise of God because of the cost to relationships that they perceive. That's the second thing. The third thing is comparison. Comparison. Did you see it at the end of chapter 13? They say, here's the problem with the place that God's promised. Like the cities are big, the people are big, the fruit's big, but the people are big too. They're like giants. They say in chapter 13, verse 33, we seem like grasshoppers in our own eyes. And we look the same to them. Like we don't size up to people like them. Yeah, the fruit's giant, but the people that grew the fruit, they're pretty giant too. And we looked at them and realized the land of promise is not for people like us. Wonder how often the phrase, not for people like us, has kept you from walking into the promise of God every day. The idea that God made you on purpose, and that he had a purpose for making you, that he didn't get the address wrong when he placed you where he's placed you, even if it's not the place that you thought you wanted to be. They didn't get the design wrong when he knitted you together in your mother's womb and he put you on earth. And yet when it comes to the presence of God and living life there every day, engaging his promise for today, how many of us have just written it off and said, that's really not for people like me? Like that's for the big people or the powerful people or the visibly gifted people who get to live in the promise and the presence of God. I'd get eaten alive if I tried to do that in the places he put me. I've looked at what I bring to the table, and come on, they've looked at what I bring to the table, and we all agree, I'm just a grasshopper, and not in the Mr. Miyagi kind of way. Like if I try to live into God's purpose for me or discover it every day, the world will squash me. They'll eat me alive. They'll devour me. I'll take the leftovers of the fruit. It looks good. If somebody else decides to go for it, I'll just take what's left over at the end. That's not for people like me. I don't compare. And comparison keeps them on the front porch looking in. Last one, resistance, relationships, comparison. The last one is coulds, coulds. I'm talking about our worries. I tried to give you a C word for the obsessive compulsive people. You needed two R's and then two C's to balance it out. So there you go. Coulds, right? The ends to the story that we write in our own minds of all of the various ways the story could play out and all of them seem bad from our vantage point, all of the things that could happen. You see it all through this passage. You especially see it in chapter 14, verse 2, don't you? He says, hey, if we go there, like our wives and our children could be taken as plunder. What could happen to my kids if we try to go into that? What happened to my family? What happened to my career? What would happen to this comfortable life that's so familiar to me? Yeah, it's less than perfect. No, it's not the promise, but it's comfortable right where I'm at. And that might be disruptive. It could if I cross over into the promise of God. Yes, eye-poppingly big fruit the provision and blessing of God, that could be something I would enjoy in the place that God's promised. And there are a lot of other things out there that could happen too, and it sure seems like they're all bad, and there's more of them than the eye-poppingly big fruit. What if the land of God's promise turns out to be the end of me? And the problems of life seem bigger than the promise of God. You know the rest of the story, how this whole story goes? God's purpose for their life was not that they would die, the land, die in the land like they're afraid. It's that they would live in his presence permanently. And yet instead, a whole generation lived out the rest of their days on the front porch of the land, and they died outside of the promise, never getting to experience it in real life. And it's a tragedy. It's a tragedy. 
In fact, it's a tragedy that shows up over and over and over, and you read through the story of God. shows up over and over, not just as a story, but as a warning. The writers of Scripture over and over say, don't let what happened to them happen to you. Don't miss the promise of God from right there on the front porch. Why did they miss it? We're so close. Why might we miss it? We're so close. I showed you four things, right? Resistance, relationships, comparison, and coulds. But remember the story at the very beginning. There are four things that hurt. There's one thing that's the cause. It's a problem with the eyes. It revealed a heart and affected their hope. And I could tell you what it is, but it's easier to show you what it is. So I want everybody to do this with me. Would you just hold up your index finger right in front of you, if you would? I want everybody to do it, even if you hate it when pastor tells everybody to do something. Because if you don't do it, then all the people around you who are doing it are going to just assume that you're judging them, and it's never good to judge people in church. So just hold up your index finger, play along just for a second, okay? Hold it right out there in front of your face. Now here's what I want you to do. I want you to close one of your eyes. Close one of your eyes, take that index finger, and I want you to use that index finger to block me out so that you can't see me. Okay? Use your index finger, one eye closed, see if you can block me out. Are you able to do it? Yeah, you can, can't you? Okay, here's a question for you. You can put your finger down. Which one's bigger, your index finger or me? See, relatively small things held right up close to your eye can block out relatively big things that stand a long way away. Listen, that's true in here. It's true with your spiritual eyes as well. The things that you hold closest to your spiritual eyes will always be the biggest things that you can see. The things you hold the closest to your spiritual eyes will always be the biggest things that you can see. Here's what happens for a bunch of us. It happened to the people of Israel and 10 of the 12 guys that did the 40-day lab spying on the promises of God. We spend our whole life holding the resistance we might face right up close to our spiritual eyes. We see how we stack up to all of the people around us and the potential problems, all the things that could happen bad for us if we take God at his word and trust him for his promise. And we either intentionally or unintentionally hold the person and promises of God at a distance. And that's a problem. It is for us and it was for the Israelites. You know why? Because the thing they held the closest to their spiritual eye was not the biggest thing And because they refused or failed to see it, they lived every day and operated every day, made decisions every day out of a totally distorted reality. And the same thing can happen to you. Can I show you something really cool? All right, think about this. They held the fear of resistance right up close to their spiritual eye, didn't they? They said, we don't want to follow God to the place that may be hard. We might face resistance. Instead, they make a decision on a distorted reality. What's the decision that they make? We want to turn back. We want to go back to Egypt. Distorted reality. What are they forgetting? Standing right there between the place that they're at that day and the place they'd come from one day back in Egypt, there's a great big giant red sea. Talk about resistance. They've forgotten the journey here. So they're distorting the journey back. And it's not only that. The armies of Egypt lay at the bottom of that sea are infinitely more powerful than all of the people of Canaan of that day. So deciding, you know, God sets us free from Egypt and going all the way to afraid of Canaan It's a little like saying our army just defeated Imperial Japan. We're shaking in our boots because of Paschal ROTC. Not that the people at Paschal ROTC aren't tough. (laughs) They don't compare. They held the fear of relationships right up close. Their comparisons to all of the other people around them right up close to their spiritual eyes. They said, we're grasshoppers. They'll squash us. We see it. And come on, they see it. But you know what's true? They didn't see it. We don't have time to turn there. I hope you'll go back and look at it this week. Look at Joshua chapter 2. 
There's a story 40 years later. Generation dies in the land. And Joshua sends two spies into the land to spy it out again. And they encounter in Joshua chapter 2 a woman named Rahab. And Rahab tells them the story of what all of the people in the land think about the people on the front porch. You know what she says? She says, we know that the Lord has given you this land. And a great fear has fallen on everyone who lives in this country. We're melting in fear because of you. Do you know why? Because they'd heard a story more than 40 years ago about a God who led his people out of Egypt across the Red Sea. That's what she says. And we know that you have a God who travels with you. And we only have gods that are far away. The 12 spies held their comparisons right up close to their spiritual eyes. And they assumed that everybody else saw the same thing that they saw. But the giants were still quaking in their boots more than 40 years later because they knew that the one coming with Israel was bigger than the biggest giant. Israel couldn't see it. They made their decision based on a totally distorted reality. Last, people of Israel held their coulds right up next to their spiritual eyes. They said, we could lose the next generation. We could lose our family in the future. So we better not risk it. Let's play it safe. Isn't it interesting? Who inherited the land at the end of the story? It's the next generation. But check it out. They did it despite their parents and grandparents, not alongside them. Because the parents and the grandparents stopped short, played it safe. Held their coulds right up close to their eyes. Listen, doxology. Come on. We can travel differently from that. We're talking about this Pray For Me campaign. You heard Nate talk about it just a little while ago. You're going to see something else about it in, in just a second. Listen, I want to encourage you to do that, to engage it, to be a part of it. Be prayed for to, to be praying for people. Listen, do not pray for my kids. If you get to pray for my kids, do not pray that my kids would just be comfortable and safe and always have a path of least resistance. Okay, don't just pray for that. You, you could pray that for my kids. Don't just pray that for my kids. Don't hold that closest to your spiritual eyes when you pray for my children. And come on, your children. Don't pray that they would hold that closest to their eyes either because I don't want them to miss out on the promise. And the promise is not always safe. It's not always comfortable. It's not always the path of least resistance. But it's always, always, always worth it. And that's what I want my kids to see and hear and experience. Alongside us. Come on, not despite us. And I don't want us to live like that's the most important thing either. Comfort, safety, path of least resistance. Because I don't want my kids to live into God's promise despite me, despite you. It's one of the things that I love so much about this particular church, doxology. We have so many Joshua's and Caleb's here. You keep following this story. You know, Caleb, Caleb's one of the two that comes back and says, no, it's worth it. We got to go. 40 years later, he's still chomping at the bit to be on the front row for what God's at work. He's 85 years old. He says, I want to take more ground. Let's go. God's promised it. He's bigger. Let's follow him. We got a lot of people just like Caleb that are walking alongside our students and our children in a place like this. Caleb didn't let resistance he didn't let relationships, he didn't let comparison, he didn't let coulds, he didn't let his age stand in the way of a chance to walk with God toward the promise of God in a place like this and to lead and to take other people with him. And don't you do it either. What are you holding closest to your spiritual eyes today? It can't be the potential for resistance. It can't be the fear of relationships and all of the comparisons. It can't be all of the coulds. You know what else it can't be that you're holding closest to your spiritual eyes? It can't be the fruit. If all you're looking at is the fruit, and isn't that what we see in the story? If all you're looking at is the things that you can get from God, the things you can accumulate from God, the things you may receive, all of the benefits you might enjoy, you'll miss it. And you'll opt out of it because the fruit alone is not worth it. 
It never has been and it never will be. You will always opt out of the promise of God if all you can see is the fruit of the promises of God and you never look to the face of the one who promised it. How do you find the face of the promiser this week? Well, listen to what an eyewitness of Jesus said. Paul says in Colossians chapter 1, Jesus is the image of the invisible God. God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his shed blood on the cross. Jesus Christ shows us the face of the promiser. He not only made God's presence and peace possible for us, he did it by taking our worst fear about God's promise. He followed God step by step in the presence of God, all the way into resistance that caused him on the night before he was crucified to beg for another way as he sweat great drops of blood. He was totally deserted and alone. Talk about relationships. at odds with the world, deserted by his followers, called crazy by his family, forsaken by his heavenly father. He chose to become weak and submit to death. All the worst coulds came true so that he could rescue you. That's the length that God in heaven is willing to go to show you how serious he is about his desire to be present with you and to take away everything that could stand in your way. And this morning, you find yourself on the front porch of his promise. And the question is, will you respond? Or is something small bigger? I'm going to pray give uh, some of you a chance to respond to him, maybe for the very first time. Accept rescue from Jesus. You've never respected, re, uh, received it before. And then after I do, we're going to have a chance to respond, all of us together. I just ask you in, in the next couple of moments not to leave. Uh, the ser- service isn't over. The sermon's not over. But we're going to respond together in song. Uh, we're going to sing a song that's familiar to some of you that just allows, allows us to confess and commit to a God who's maybe bigger than we thought he was when we walked into a place like this today. And to look towards the face of the one who's promised us part of the message, part of the invitation of God for us today, and an invitation for all of us to respond, right where we're at, whatever that looks like on the journey you're on. Would you pray with me? It's possible that you have come to this morning, you realize you've you've been doing a lot of rule keeping, and you've started doing some rituals. You realize that you've never received rescue, and you'll never keep enough rules, do enough rituals to make yourself right with God. The story of God is that God sent Jesus to be what you couldn't be and do what you needed to do so that he could take away everything that stands in the way of God's promise for you. And he offers it to you as a gift if you'll only receive it. So right in this moment, the way that you might respond, the presence of God and the invitation of God is simply to take the gift. You could do that in your own words, right where you're at. It's as simple as just telling God. Prayer is just talking to God. God, I, I realize that I've done a lot of rituals and tried to keep some rules, but I need you to rescue me. I need you to set me free. I need you to forgive my sins. And I believe Jesus came to do that. That he died on a cross, that he rose from the dead, and he offers me life with a capital L, with you forever. Not just the chance to go to heaven when I die, certainly the chance to go to heaven when I die, but the presence of God with me and in me and through me even while I live. And I'm receiving that as a gift this morning. And Father, for those that are responding for the very first time, and for all of us, Lord, who have an invitation to respond for the next step, whatever it looks like, Lord, we pray that we would look to the face of the promiser in these moments. And that as we sing, it might reflect a heart, uh, some of us have confession to realize that we've got a lot of stuff standing in the way of us seeing you. Or for some of us, Lord, the, the opportunity to, to, to commit to walking this week into a place that We see resistance as possible. The relationships will be hard. That we don't feel like we measure up and we wonder if it's really for somebody like us to live a life in your presence towards your purpose.
of all of the things that could happen. And yet in this moment, we choose to rest in this place and to leave the rest in your hands. To stop negotiating with you and promising things that we'll do and instead to look to you and who you are, even now as we respond in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.